I hear thunder. I'm hearing thunder, yeah, too. This is going to be a... We have a dramatic, dramatic setting today full of both hum mm-hmm. and thunder. Well, God willing, we don't fuck it up as bad as the space shuttle program. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, well, I, 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 get, I get... Here we are. Um, in the middle of the storm of the century, mm-hmm. uh, here to record a, a podcast, uh, our first podcast about space. space. It is not our first podcast about space. We've done the Nadalen disaster. That was about space. That's ah, barely that space. That was tangentially about space. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What, what kind of rocket blew up? Was it, was it a land rocket? Did was it, it make an, it to space? Where was no, it supposed no, it to go? Space did no, it, go, but that's a it, land it, it, disaster. It, it only it doesn't go to space. It never it, achieves. Listen, orbit. listen. If you try and it kill goes, someone, they charge you with attempted murder, right? So if you, right. that's an attempted space flight, that still counts. That's a space disaster. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. <sighs> I, I'm, I, I, I. This is the first. This, this is the first podcast where we talk about something that stays in space for an extended period of time with some thunder for dramatic effect and that's some right. humming that we don't and, know what it and is some humming. I think the humming might be related to the, the storm possibly yeah so uh, let me just get out ahead of all the commentaries and shut up well, at least don't listen to it if you hate at least, it so much at least, at least I'm back and we won't have any discord beeps this time yes yeah, o- o- okay. yeah we got some feedback well, <laughs> Welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. O- okay, go. I am Alice Caldwell Kelly. I'm the person who's talking now. My pronouns, she and her. Yay, hey, Liam. Hi. Yay, hey, Liam. I'm Liam Anderson. My pronouns are he, him. And today we have a guest. We guest. have a guest. <laughs> Guest, uh, my name is Clark Newman. He, him. Why are you here, Clark? What the fuck do you know? <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> Justify know. yourself. Y'all ask, y'all, told, y'all ask me to be here. <laughs> what special qualifications? I, I'm not doing the cat and mouse. What qualifications do you have to be on this podcast? Well, okay. To be fair, I, I my job title is Advanced Mission Design Engineer. I work on site at Johnson Space Center doing spacey stuff uh, with a contracting company, and uh, yeah, so I know about space. I I know not so much about the shuttle, other than I worked a couple shuttle missions very early in my career before uh, it went bye bye. But remotely, kind of from Goddard mm. Space Center, so good enough. Um, it almost doesn't count in in a way. It does um, too. It's like, yeah. <laughs> What 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 it, is it, it about space people? What is it about space people that makes them humble like this? Like you talk to any astronaut, right? And you'll be like, "Hey, was it cool when you saw the Earth from space?" And they will always, <laughs> always affect this like fucking folksy Ohioan simple country dirt farmer bullshit. It was like, "Well, yeah, I guess it was kind of cool when I saw the Earth from space." When I saw the Earth from space, <laughs> yes, when I achieved a miracle, man has jumped up yeah, for when, thousands when, of years. When, yeah, when, okay. when I helped, oh, I when so I helped passe, a you guy, know. It, when I I helped put shit in orbit around a like moving uh, astronomical body. That was yeah. I, I wouldn't really count that as like you know subject <laughs> matter expertise. Top 10. Not even yeah. top ten. Yeah. Well, I'm just yeah. a simple country astronaut. But... <laughs> <laughs> I actually looked at uh, printouts from a dot matrix printer of these things called uh, interrange ranging vectors. Um, it would. I, I don't really want to get too deep into it because it would be extremely boring. But um, it was very uh, like lost. But every 108 minutes, you got to push the button. So um, a lot of nothing is automated, you know, with respect to that program. And lots of fingers were in it. Um, lots of jobs were impacted by it. Um, but um, yeah, let's get into it. So uh, today we're gonna talk about um, a railroad company. That's right. Um, which you can see over here. But they also do something else, which is launch the space shuttle. 
Yeah, our, um, fa- our favorite yeah. class three railroad, NASA. NASA. <laughs> oh yes, it's side gig, of course. Yes. <laughs> Listen, in. well, this is actually the uh, this is actually the the crawler that we're looking at right now, isn't it? Or wait, which mm-hmm. one are we looking at? Yeah, the crawler guy. Oh, but you've also got the railer highlighted. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. No. This is like in this economy, everybody's got to have two jobs. So railroads, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. space light. Grind never sleeps, baby. <laughs> had, had to grind for this view, and it's just the Earth from space. <laughs> yeah, today, today we're going to talk about the space shell program. Whole thing. The whole damn thing. Start um, to finish. Yep. <laughs> obviously, at some point, we'll probably go more into detail about certain parts of it in yeah, future episodes. Yeah, two aspects of it. This is a whole broad overview of the space shuttle program. Mm. Shuttle 101. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. But first, we have to do... The goddamn news. Boo this man. Boo. I ne- I nearly sampled and used the audio of you guys trying to do the news noise yourselves for this. <laughs> you should have. I should have. Be funny. I should have. But instead, instead, I was too mad at Richard Branson for not dying in space. Well, that's it's very true. understandable. Did he really go to space? No. If you were to ask me, I've I've uh, taken a firm, controversial stance on no. <laughs> he went to like h- how high up did Richard Branson, uh, telecoms entrepreneur, private island owner, and like general dipshit Cola go guy? G- yeah, yeah, go into space. It was like fifty kilometers up, right? Failed operator of the West Coast Main Line. Don't yes. forget that one. That uh. also true. Uh, yeah, he he has failed at uh, at going into space, much like he has failed to operate British British trains uh, by going to like sort of fifty kilometers above the uh, the Earth's surface, and like the lowest sort of like more controversial definition of the boundary of space is eighty kilometers, and then the like sort of more more accepted one is a hundred kilometers, just for nice round numbers. Uh, but he didn't do either of those. He got in a, a, a sort of a a private spacecraft owned and operated by himself and uh, did a did a suborbital flight. So got as high as a weather balloon. <sighs> yep, yep. And wow. uh, uh, after a, a, a mere, you know, sixty years, we've come mm-hmm. back to Mercury Redstone and doing <laughs> doing suborbital flights just to say that we could. Um, which is great. I love this. This is cool. He's gonna like probably try and sell tickets on these. Um, I mean, Lance Bass didn't Lance Bass of NSYNC go to space, or was his mission cancelled? There have been a bunch of weird space tourists. Yeah, I I, I know this, like, th- this is just a thing when you get too much money. Like, Jeff Bezos said that, like, the only thing he could think to do with the money that he has is, like, spend it on, on, on space flight, which is possibly the worst thing I've ever heard. Yeah. So... <laughs> It's very confusing to me because, like, like you know, the, the, these two guys, Bezos and um, Richard Branson, are both competing. You know, they were competing to be the first billionaire in space. Elon Musk could do it tomorrow if he wanted to. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Lance Bass was rejected. Uh, yes. He was he was going to go to uh, like. Um, Star City and do it, and then his financial sponsors backed out. Yeah, he he uh, he, he couldn't raise the uh, the twenty million dollars, and so uh, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, was like no ticket. Damn, which is cool. <laughs> went through went through all the training, and they were just like nah, yet. Uh, what if what if the t- ticket was remo- revoked after they lifted off? They'd have to take him to the back of the spaceship and throw him just off. kick him off. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's polar express. Him. Yeah, you, you, you just. <laughs> I guess the alternative is you're just like in in the Soyuz and you see a little sticker up there that's like you know penalty fare uh, if for no ticket and you're just like sweating just you know, like mm-hmm. oh fuck they're gonna fucking the ticket inspector's gonna come to they us. Had to, like, they had to put they're, they're gonna put me off at the space station. <laughs> <laughs> you live here now. <laughs> yeah, just washing dishes at the space station, trying to earn passage back. Well, well that's the, that's space news. What about that, that, that's space news? The opposite of space, which is trains. Hmm. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm I'm logging off for the next hour and a half, Justin. So we yours. Yeah, Ross, go. Amtrak's buying new trains, and they're fucking stupid. 
Why are they stupid, Roz? All right. So what they're doing is they decided we have this whole nice electric fleet of locomotives, right? And they're going to replace them with dual mode electro diesel locomotives, right? So what they're doing, the, the, the logic here is, well, now we can run through trains from electric territory into non-electric territory seamlessly. Um, but what, you know, what they're actually just doing is they've decided, well, we're America's only passenger railroad. We're going to commit to fossil fuels until at least 2050. This is the dumbest fucking thing I've seen in my entire life. They're also spending altogether too much money on it. Um, I, I can't believe they're, they're getting away with doing this. Um, but I, this, this is, this is, it, it's crap. Uh, it's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> Get their asses. Yes. Um, it, it's just bizarre. You, you go from electric locomotives to sort of electric locomotives. Yeah, just, <laughs> just step oh. backwards. But we got, we, we got an Amtrak guy in the White House for all that availed us. You know, I was about to say, yeah. Um, We've we've got Pete Buttigieg as Secretary of Transportation. That's progressive, right? So, yeah, exactly. Uh, we have a we have a we have a a, a gay CIA train guy <laughs> making sure. <laughs> I think it's a gay CIA bike guy first. You and take foremost. what you can get, right. I guess. He yeah. is a bike guy as well. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah. So that's this. This is incredible. I I could talk for an hour and thirty minutes on this, but I will save that for a future episode. <laughs> People have been complaining that the episodes are too short, so frankly, go off, you know? <laughs> I don't want to do it on the news. <laughs> the goddamn news. Plus 10 seconds about the shuttle. <laughs> All right. So we need to ask a, a question here. Mm. What, what is space? Mm -hmm. It's really big. Yes. It's it, okay. not Earth. Check it out. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys got it from here. <laughs> uh, sp space isn't. It's a, it, it's a thing where there isn't a thing. Or possibly there are some things we can't detect those things, or those yes. things are like the inverse of things that we can detect. Yes. Um, it's, it's got a lot of weird shit in it. Yes, it has um, trees shaped like X's. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, you know, like fucking uh, like you know, the planets made of diamonds, uh, mm -hmm. like you know, underground lakes of like you know, hydrogen, mercury, just, or whatever. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, just go to I fucking love science, and they'll tell you where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, my understanding is space is up. That's mm. where it is. And that's that's like Cardi B. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I suppose if you go down far enough. You would it's also it could reach be down. space. Oh, that's the hollow earth. <laughs> um, so why, why would you go to space? It's cool. Astronaut mining or uh, asteroid mining. Astronaut Astro mining. Astronaut yeah. mining. Suck it, Morris. Dad, <laughs> mine the shit out of this astronaut. <laughs> he knows what he um, did. Yes. <laughs> uh, embarrass communists. That seems to be the main reason, honestly. Embarrass capitalists. Conversely, it's another another reason to do it. Uh, because there's stuff up there that you want to like, uh, look at, but you can't like photograph it very easily. So you just like run a thing into it or shoot a probe at it or, you know, uh, use take a some... legal loophole to go over it without being in its airspace. Y yeah, exactly. Hell yeah. If you want to point that telescope inwards, you can like you can do all kinds of shit. You can see what the Soviets are up to. Uh, yeah. You can read newspapers over people's shoulders, allegedly. Am I not allowed to sue for a satellite encroaching on my airspace? <laughs> I thought property rights went all the way to the heavens and straight to hell. This was my understanding. Well, we're getting into a sort of a theological discussion <laughs> well, about the where the heavens... Well, firmly outside of space, I believe. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. It's like, but also, space isn't airspace, it's space space. 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 Some call it the final frontier. That's true. Some, no, some, that's some Alaska, do call it that. but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, space, God, space. Space, is, space is a difficult place, uh, almost as inhospitable as Alaska. Uh, only mm -hmm. uh, no, yeah, no polar bears fewer in bears. space. Fewer bears. Yeah. Th th things Alaska has in common with space. Uh, the government might pay you to live there. Uh, it's relentlessly hostile to human life. Yes. Hey, me too. 
<laughs> Space, also commonly called Seward's Folly. It's got, uh, it's, 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 got, it's got like a bunch of secret military shit in it that nobody really knows what it's for. Right. Um, Dorad. Yeah. It, yeah. Dorad, but in space. Over the you horizon put, Yeah, radar. you can put uh, ballistic missiles through it. It's cold. Yes. This, I mean, really, the similarities rarely, you know, they, they go pretty far. There's lots of water, but it's ice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, ice, baby. Yes. Um... So yeah, there's lots of reasons you would go to space or to go to Alaska. Um, Let's not go that far. Yes. So uh, well, I've been to Alaska. I haven't been to space. So maybe I should. Maybe I should go to space. Yeah, that, uh, um, Richard, if you're guy. listening, um, get <laughs> if you have a spare seat on the Virgin Galactic, and also you don't you don't mind like me yelling at Roz and calling him a class traitor the whole time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Consider taking Just sign us up. Yeah. What? So you're you, so so you're gonna sit in the seat next to me and yell at me the whole time. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's being on my job. Spaceship. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's that. Yeah, that's we'll do, what we can the, take it in space. We can take it in turns. Yeah. That's what the, the well, there's your problem tour experience is. Uh, it is getting yelled at a lot. Yeah. Mm. No, I can confirm. <laughs> now, one thing I would like to note: when you go to space, make sure the rocket is in forward. Mm. Yes, Looney Tunes taught us. Mm. Yeah, you don't yes. want to. You don't want to nudge the rocket into into yes. reverse. Yeah, not good. Not good. You go underground then. Mm. You can you can do science in space. You can like throw some like dogs or rats or like mold <laughs> up there, mm -hmm. and then yeah. you can look at them and see what they do. Uh, and you know sometimes that's interesting. You can see what it does to a person. Um, you can see what it does. You could you could just send a dog up there, and then it dies, and you're like, this was a great success. <laughs> I feel I feel like I'm gonna get quite partisan if I point out that most of the dogs that the Soviet Union put in space lived. <laughs> the first one they didn't yes! even try yeah. to bring it down. Oh, okay, no, okay, no, they did. Okay, they did fully like murder Laika, but like otherwise, like if we're talking about like Belka and Strelka and stuff, no, they those dogs survived because they that was part of the reason for putting them up there was to test whether you could like return a like living uh like a mammal uh to Earth alive from space. So didn't we send like the United States sent a bunch of monkeys up there that died? Yeah, yeah, we sent sure. chimps. We brought some chimps back, but um, the, <clears throat> I, I always wonder why chimps versus dogs. What was the um, driving behind those those animal, animal choices? Sentimentally attached to chimps, maybe. Who's to say? We need higher order life to murder. <laughs> just, somebody in NASA was like, "Yeah, we got to make sure that like none of these other higher primates get any ideas." Yeah, exactly. It's just an astronaut holding a knife to a chimp's throat. Don't get any fucking funny ideas. <laughs> in the right stuff, they says they they actually would shock their feet to uh, get them to push the buttons that they want. Jesus, that's rude. Well, that's that rude. That's pretty rude, yeah. man. Okay, well, so it's not right, quite well, a knife to the right, throat. Right. Hmm. Bummer. All right. Um, whoever wrote the notes for this one, what are we looking at? Uh, we are looking at a Saturn V rocket, which I have chosen to make the point about what we did before the space shuttle. And what we did before the space shuttle was big rocket go to space. This is very simple and very that, intuitive. I say very simple, it isn't, but like that, it's intuitive. Up, just so everyone's aware. Because it's a big tube of explosives, right? Like that's that's it it's not simple, but it is straightforward in that sense, if you follow me. Um mm -hmm. There are, however, some limiting factors to putting stuff in space on top of a big rocket. Uh, first of all, you have uh, the Sholkovsky rocket equation, or sometimes called the tyranny of the rocket equation, uh, which is that you have to carry all of the fuel that you need, um, and then you have to carry all the fuel that you need to carry that fuel, and then you need all the fuel that you need to carry to carry the fuel that you need to carry the fuel to carry the fuel, and then you need to carry the fuel, which carries the fuel that you need to carry the fuel that My carries head the fuel. <laughs> so it, yeah, there's, there's, there's like that's a limiting factor. Another limiting factor is that like you can sort of like you have to build a new rocket if you want to put something else in space. Like you can kind of maybe recover and refurbish some, some bits of it that like jettison and fall back to Earth, but like not reliably. Um, so that's sort of that's sort of a problem, but. 
we have a solution to this because we have planes. We already have planes. Plus, most of the guys who are like doing this rocketry stuff are all Air Force guys anyway. So they're all thinking in the back of their heads, like, okay, can we apply the principles of aircraft to uh, to put thing in space? Next slide, please. Talk about the uh, the Boeing X twenty dinosaur. I love oh, this wow. thing. Dinosaur here is D Y N A hyphen S O A R. Nice, yes. Oh wow. Back when the future was cool. Nineteen sixty six, they planned this first, um, and the idea is that like this sort of like this this plane thing, it like it bolts on. It's the top stage of a rocket. You launch it like a rocket. And then it it like it separates those uh, those stages. And then once you're done doing whatever you need to do in space, it, this this vehicle re-enters the atmosphere separately uh, and glides to a runway, uh, which you have a certain amount of control from, like having like you know like a lifting wing and like control surfaces. So um, let me get this straight. So this hmm. bit has all the expensive stuff in it. Yes. And you bolt it on top of the big fuel tank bullshit that has the cheap stuff in it, right? Mm hmm Okay. Then you and don't have to remanufacture the expensive e shit. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, there are a bunch of, like, technical, let's say, challenges. Let's be generous and say challenges here. Sure. Uh, okay. Like, if, if, you, if you do some very, 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 very complicated maths wrong, then uh, you skip this thing off the atmosphere like a you know a, a stone in a pond, and everybody dies in space. Uh, or if you do it wrong in the other way, you just plunge this into the atmosphere, it melts, and everybody dies in the atmosphere. And then if you do some more maths wrong, then you like get it through re-entry, and it lands on a runway, a tire explodes, and everybody dies on ground. Um, it all comes back to tires. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Make them more rigid. <laughs> Pretty much. Now, I, I, there are a bunch of these projects. Uh, most of them got cancelled pretty quickly. The the dinosaur only lasted like two years. Um, and I, my gut feeling is, and I'm I'm begging to be corrected on this one, uh, that it's less that those problems were like technically insurmountable even in 1966, and more that like there wasn't really that much of a reason to do this. Um, because the stuff that you were trying to do in space in the 60s was, you know, go to the moon, land on the moon, uh, return a man safely to Earth from the moon. Uh, it, it requires different, different tools, and you don't really, like, you're not doing a lot of, like, repetitive stuff, which is what you would ideally hope to use a space plane for. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, I've been, uh, there's one thing I'm confused about. Oh, please. Which is skipping off the atmosphere, right? Yeah. I don't know much about space. I have played Kerbal Space Program, though. <laughs> and it's my understanding that when you hit the atmosphere, you slow down. Yeah. Which then makes you sort of, you know, um, deorbit, right? Mm -hmm. Typically, I, yeah. But you, you can with enough... If you generate a little, little through an oopsie days, you generate too much lift as you're barreling into the atmosphere, you could go back up. Or if you come in with too much energy and you don't bleed it off in time, you will go back into space. One, one fun thing about the dinosaur uh, is that they actually intended on paper to, for it to be able to do this on purpose. Um, they genuinely intended to, like, to be able to like track uh, different satellites and satellites changing course in orbit. Uh, they intended to be able to like bounce it off the atmosphere purposefully, and um, I, I will say that like one of the reasons why this didn't get off the paper stage is that the G forces that were supposed to like happen to the crew at this point were uh, substantial, and I'm doing air quotes. <laughs> Yeah, it's got it's got a bit of a kick when you you bounce <laughs> off the edge. Listen, you, you know you know it's bad when a bunch of like right stuff guys who like smoke unfiltered cigarettes all day every day nice. are like are like no, this is too dangerous. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna go you're gonna go to uh, you're gonna go from Mach thirty two to Mach seventy five by way of <laughs> Mach two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> 
only the X-29 dinosaur. The comet? This is gonna be a lot fucking worse. <laughs> only the X-20 dinosaur reduces an entire marine lieutenant colonel to a soup like homogenous. <laughs> <laughs> give me the give me the next slide because this one I love. This is this is a landing test vehicle that the Soviets made called the MiG one hundred and five, and I include it only because it's adorable. This was their, this was their attempt to do the same thing, but they only used it for like uh, test landings. But I love it. It looks like a gym shoe. It's delightful. It looks like, it looks like a little. It is delightful. What this is, is this tiny thing little... sticking out the side? Is that a sled? Yeah, because this was their solution to uh, the, one of the, the well to the tire, to the tire problem. problem. Yeah, and the <laughs> same the same for the dinosaur. In fact, was that every every tire that they could build at that time would just be destroyed whenever it landed at the speed the minimum speed it could have done. So their solution was we put it on like little little skis, um, and we make those out of the same thing as the hull, and this is gonna be fine. This is gonna could be fine. You... Don't worry about it. Alright, my dinner's could, here, I gotta go on mute. Oh boy. <laughs> could you, um, could you, uh, uh, was it landing on, like, snow? Or was it no, landing no, on just a an ordinary No, no, a paved run? runway, and a really long one, too. How, it's how did, it, oh man, did it just, so could, it must have just been a show of sparks. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. How, which how is, did you steer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how much that how much that was a concern. What if there? What if you have to do a crosswind landing? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! There there is also a, another alternative to like making making a spacecraft that's more like a plane, and that's you attach the spacecraft to a plane. Uh, that flies like very high and very fast, and you launch it from the plane and then try and go to space. Uh, nobody really does this. The Air Force, the US Air Force, tried it um, with like sort of an unmanned like missile thing, uh, but like apparently the benefits of doing that are like pretty marginal, uh, and it's also like insanely complicated even for like space standards. Yeah, like, if it's, it, if it's it goes, done hmm. for small scale. It's it, it's done. Uh, there's a Pegasus. There used to be a Pegasus. There's or the the Richard Branson flight was done with a with a big airplane dropping a rocket. Um, hmm. But yeah, you wouldn't want to be unless it, you, you you're pretty limited in the size. That that monster airplane that drops the uh, Virgin rocket. That's the thing it drops is the Virgin. That's pretty much as good as you can get with, hmm. with regards to putting people in space that way. Yeah. Also, it's like a ton more more dangerous because if something goes wrong, you also manage to lose a plane into the into the bargain, which is fun. I I always like the school of thought that says you elevate the launch pad, you know, <laughs> ten thousand feet or so. Yeah, you, 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 by way you, of a large tower. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like the first step of a space elevator. Yeah. I'm I'm still I have not done the uh, math I need to work on this but slingshots um from the <laughs> ground if they need to attach giant winches to start the first 10 seconds of liftoff I th I think you could save a lot of fuel that way I have nothing <laughs> to back this up but I think it's possible <laughs> You just see you just see the crawler just hauling in a bunch of trebuchets Now I so thought like, maybe, exactly. maybe you could have some kind of large gun to shoot things into space, and I intend to find some kind of tin pot dictator to fund my idea, and this will not go wrong in any way. No, you, you certainly <laughs> will not be killed by Mossad. Uh, and another fun option, uh, what if we detonated a nuclear weapon under the spacecraft that we wanted to send to space? You're and supposed to fact. do that in space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd think, but the, it has been seriously mooted that no, we just we just do it on land and stay far enough away from it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord! Well, next slide, please, because uh, in case in case you're you're unfamiliar, viewers who are joining us late may not be aware um, that the United States did in fact send people to the moon. Uh, they went to the moon. They they played golf on the moon. There wasn't a lot going on on the moon, is the thing. Um, it's kind of like, after a while, the American public eh, kind of sailed on the moon. Kind of bored of the moon. Um, yeah, not much up there. Kind of boring. No. So the next thing was to go to Mars, but instead of doing that, uh, one, of the, one of the things that sort of like became more popular, largely because it was, you know, 
cheaper it was to like build space stations like permanent uh like encampments in in low earth orbit uh where you could do science like skylab uh where you could um Operate a spy camera yourself instead of using it as a satellite. That was a plan. That was a a plan that both the U.S. and the Soviets did was to have a manned spy station. Uh, the Soviets also armed theirs. They they, they tried putting a, an <laughs> aircraft cannon on theirs. Mm -hmm. Did it work? Uh, I I don't actually know if they ever fired it or not <laughs> in space. <laughs> is I, the thing I believe they did. I I remember hearing about this, and I believe. One of, they did some parting shots with it just out there, <laughs> and nothing in particular. Yeah, we just the, the, when yeah. humanity is obliterated, it's going to be because the Soviet Union accidentally shot an alien over like several several light years. Some guy permanently manning the uh, anti air gun, just hoping to see an asteroid or something. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, I, I I don't mean to be too down on space stations, right? Because you can you can do a lot of like useful stuff, and the idea is not like a bad one, especially if you you're planning to like use them to like, uh, as like a, a, a sort of a way station to do longer space flight. Uh, but the problem is that like y y they need a lot of stuff. They need a lot of logistics. Not only do they need like an entire room full of people working twenty four seven to make sure that they don't die, uh, but they also need like regular supplies of stuff, food, water, uh, and conversely, you know, taking trash back home, uh, taking people who want to get off Mister Earth's wild ride back home. Uh, if there's an emergency, you need to like be able to evacuate people. So you need uh, a, a, a spacecraft that can do a lot of like broadly pre-planned, uh, very similar sort of profiled space flights on a regular basis with like uh, very little deviation, so that people don't you know starve to death in space. But as we have seen from the Saturn V. Spacecraft are expensive, uh, and you got to drive those costs down because governments don't like spending money. Uh, there's two sort of ways of solving this problem, right? There's the there's the Soviet way, which is you, you make a spacecraft that's very simple, very reliable, and very cheap. Um, you know, you sort of simplify and add weight, but you know, without the adding weight part. Or you try and make a reusable spacecraft. Uh, next slide, please. I have two fun facts uh, before oh, we go. Since we talked about, uh, okay, this is Skylab, right? Mm. The interior was designed by Raymond Lowy, same guy who did a bunch of streamlined trains, including the GG1. Huh. Um, another yeah, fun Sky, fact. Skylab's weird. This, this yeah. is a weird 1970s moment in NASA history where they like sort of semi went on strike for a bit. Yes. Um, <laughs> Like all, all wearing yep. orange coveralls, it, it was very like I don't it know. It was aesthetic. a Skylab strike, yeah, yeah. The uh, worm, I think that's when the worm started. <laughs> hey, the Sky, the Skylab astronauts still deny that they were on strike, which to my <laughs> mind makes them cowards. It's uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> is it cowardice, yeah. or is it are they just not snitching? Well, none of them ever flew in space again because NASA is a very vindictive agency, like all of the federal government. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. they, they defected to the cosmonauts. <laughs> God, you, you just know that when they did the first Apollo, Apollo Soyuz docking, there were serious plans on both sides for what if one of these guys wants to defect to us, right? <laughs> oh, that'd, that'd be, be a good movie. As hell. I'd yeah. watch that. Yeah. So. We've got the man side. There's also the unmanned side. It's my next slide. Uh, uh, I have another is... another fun fact. Oh, hit me with a fun know, fact. There is a bishop of the moon. Is this one of those things you can pay a hundred dollars and like get yourself ordained bishop of the moon? No, no, it's a real bishop of the moon. Hmm. Because the first manned mission to the moon uh, departed from the diocese of Orlando. Uh, the Diocese of Orlando has jurisdiction over the whole moon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> that's a, that's, that's how a it big, works. That's how, that's a, quite the, quite the promotion. 
Well, I, I mean, there are very few people on the moon. In the last, so in the last seen... ten years, the moon <laughs> has uh, has settled with more than five million dollars worth of abuse lawsuits. <laughs> I was gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yes, but there's there's very few people on the moon, so they haven't been controversy reason... free for years, maybe. <laughs> yeah, months. haven't found a reason to split the diocese yet. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you, there's a confessional up there covered in the gold foil from the leg like, descent module. <laughs> oh, that's another fun fact from the uh, from the Skylab is when uh, there was an issue and they just had to, <clears throat> with a, a, a plate, uh, some exposure causing a thermal issue, and they just unfurled some gold foil. And you can see it in some of the photos of it where they literally just unfurled some foil in space just to cover it up, as if, as one would, a broken window to their car. Yeah. Put, put a tarp on it. <laughs> put a tarp on it, yeah. Exactly. They put a, it, it, it is a space tarp. Yeah. Space as, far, tarp. As, far, as far as religion and space, I will also point out that, uh, that Buzz Aldrin uh, took communion on the moon. Uh, but he he was not a Catholic. He was, I think, a Presbyterian. So that doesn't. So like the first celebrant of of like a, a religious sacrament on the moon was not a Catholic. Uh, I was about to say that would be um, that I think you would actually need to send a priest up to do a uh, to do it. Wait, on, so, so he, he, I mean that's that's Protestants for you. It's like the Brotherhood of All Believers kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. like you know, it's just like you know, just do it yourself. Um, we're, bring, we're bringing up a, a person to celebrate the mass up there, just so we can bring some booze up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you have you have seen that, like occasionally, Russian uh, or, r like Roscosmos will have Orthodox priests bless spacecraft by like uh, anointing them with holy water from a brush, which is Ooh, cool. Nice, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah, uh, the cosmonauts <laughs> also used to be able to bring vodka up on Mir. They can't do it on the International <laughs> Space Station. You know, it's a dry, dry county. That's lame. It's a, yeah, it is a dry You should be able to just station. keep it on the Soviets, or I mean, on the Russian side. Yeah, on the Russian side. <laughs> just put Come a on. big tape down the middle, yeah. <laughs> Come mm, to just, Russia, just put, a, put one of those little signs, no drinks past this line. <laughs> you, are, you are now leaving the American sector. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, we got to talk about uh, satellites, and like... There are several uses for satellites. Most of them are boring. Like they can, they can sometimes tell you what your position is on Earth. They can sometimes give you bad television. But more importantly, they allow you to spy on your nation's enemies. Um, ah, yes. This is. Now, is this, this actually Corona, or is this some other spy thing? I'm not actually sure if it is. Uh, yeah. Like. This is the thing. It's like, all it, similar. It, these are the these drop hmm. off the uh, physical film canisters. Yeah, uh, like the, yeah. the the thing All that right. I wanted to These highlight guys. is that like spy satellites used film until surprisingly recently, and the recovery of those is is really fun because, as you say, they would just like shoot them back off, deorbit them, and they were intended to be recovered in flight too. Uh, you just have like a a, a C one thirty like hook the parachute and just like reel them back in, so there wasn't yeah, any some, chance of. Uh, there's some pictures of those. But um, I guess we don't have it. But that's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah they would. They were just a big hook out of the back of an airplane, just snag it right by its uh, parachute lines. Could, yep. could, and could you could you re could you restock it with film? No. When you, when, you have, when you don't have a big, when you you have a big spaceship film. from Kodak that <laughs> shows up. <laughs> when you when you're out of rolls of film on on a keyhole satellite, you just had an expensive bricked satellite. Uh, mm -hmm. Which was also like too risky to deorbit in case it deorbited somewhere you didn't want it to. Uh, so like, you know, for all we know, they're still up there. Um, you get a big, big, uh, big space station floating by that says FedEx Kinkos on the side. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it would Photo be development in one hour or less. <laughs> <laughs> And sp spy satellites are fun. Uh, you know, more more recently we have like ones that are able to like upload imagery directly, and like are able to like maneuver themselves significantly more efficiently. And if you believe some people online, able to sort of like hide themselves from like direct visual contact from Earth, which is fun. Um, but like that, that's like. A large, large part of what you what you want to put in space is, especially during the Cold War, you want to put one of these like 
permanently on station, like it's doing a rotation of of the Earth such that it hits, you know, a, a you know a dockyard in, in in Leningrad every however many hours. Um, so you can just like get sequences of images. Uh, next slide, please. One of these whole canisters is just photos of one dockyard in Leningrad, and it's like you know, and and, and nothing of note happened. And that's one quarter of the way to breaking the satellite. <laughs> that, I, I genuinely think that would not be far from the truth, especially in like the dying days of the Cold War. It's like a, a lot of like sort of intelligence estimates were more by inference of what the Soviets weren't doing than what they were. Uh, so yeah, a hundred percent. It it brought, it came back to Earth, and then that was like right after right after uh, Kodak stopped processing Kodachrome. They're like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, the, we can't the, do shit with the, this. The, like, the National <laughs> Reconnaissance Office has to get really into like developing their own film, when previously they'd just been sending it off. Well, I don't believe anyone's managed to DIY the Kodachrome process, because it's so damn complicated. Mm. Um, I think they stopped developing about a decade ago. There was like one camera shop that could still do it, and then they closed. God damn. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the space shuttle. Ah, uh, yes, that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, uh, 41 mere... minutes into the episode. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because the space shuttle is something that you develop if you, if you want to have another crack at having a space plane, and also you want to, like, uh, you know, go back and forth to a space station whose location you know, or launch a bunch of satellites, often for spying, or, and this is the fun one, if you want to kidnap a non-cooperative satellite and yes. return it yes. to us. Yes. yes. Hell yeah. This is mine now. He's <laughs> 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 singing wailing songs as you just like whistle back with a rogue satellite in tow. That's what they just, needed was a harpoon gun. <laughs> Never know you're going to know, man. The I, I, more than anything now, I want to hear a space shuttle themed version of the Weller Man. One of you can record that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Justin, I think you wrote this slide. I did write this slide, and and what I did was I put down some notes about stuff which I was going to research and then didn't. Oh, it's um, fine. I'll do it. So yeah, like, exactly. So, <laughs> so what, I'm what not is good at what, space? What is a space shuttle made of? Well, it's the same ideas that, like, as the dinosaur. Basically, it's you. You launch off of a rocket because that's straightforward. But you have a plane bit that, like, separates and then that re-enters the atmosphere. Um, so we have an orbiter, which is the big plane-looking bit. That's uh, this guy. Uh, yep. Not and then to be we have confused with this. This also looks like a plane, but that's because it is a plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. Thank you. I'll mm -hmm. do it. Then we have a gigantic fuel tank, uh, like attached to the orbiter, and either side of that, two solid rocket boosters. Uh, so the middle one is liquid fuel, and the outer two are solid fuel. Um, and so solid fuel, solid rockets are, are fun because once they're going, they're just going. Uh, they, they are not like, you don't have like a variable thrust kind of thing, as I understand it. Uh, don't need it. Mm -hmm. That's no. some that's some fucking commie bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Go fast. Up. One straight line. Yeah. One straight line. <laughs> <laughs> well, like th these are a very efficient way of getting you out of like sort of low altitude and up into high altitude, and then the higher you get before you can like touch off a a, a liquid rocket engine, the more efficient it's going to be. Yeah, they're the cheap, thing. and they're cheap and part of the reusable you know aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these get then, jettisoned you know, early, we'll, we'll, and then we'll, this is foreshadowing mm -hmm. the cheap, you know, what that buys you. I yeah, kinda, I, I always thought like the thrust seems unbalanced with the orbiter just hanging off the side. Yeah, that actually shoot. If you kind of get an angle on it, you can see they the uh, the three main engines are actually shooting off at an angle, and the whole thing kind of goes at a wonky angle, not it's straight gimbled. up. Oh, fantastic! Yes, and, I love it. <laughs> and so there's a little bit of uh, wasted thrust, you know. You don't put all your thrust in the same direction, but you know, I guess they they swallowed that and they're okay with it. And there's lots of other things, uh, you know, compromises in its design. Yeah, we could go on and on about. And and we will. <laughs> and we will. Yeah. I don't want to overload it, front load it, but you know. Yeah. 
I guess, <laughs> I guess I guess start to finish, I should say the idea is right. You you build a bunch of these orbiters. You have a bunch of them on standby, uh, and then for each for each mission, you build and supply that liquid fuel tank and the solid rocket boosters. You assemble them all together. Uh, in a sort of easy sort of insert tab A into slot B process that only takes like 10 minutes and five guys. You move the whole assembly onto a launch pad, you launch it up like a rocket uh, off, of, off of that sort of launch infrastructure. Uh, that you, you ideally recover the solid rocket boosters if you can, probably give up hope for the, for the liquid fuel tank. The orbiter does whatever it needs to do in space, comes back from space, uh, like re-enters Earth's atmosphere, doesn't skip off, doesn't burn to pieces, lands on a runway like a plane with tires, because we invented like tires that could do that, or more importantly, yeah, I mean, like shielding for those tires. Really, uh, and, really big, big tires, big yeah. mud tires. <laughs> and then <laughs> while while you're sort of uh, like, then you go on and do the same thing with the next orbiter. And while that's happening, the orbiter you just got back goes to the back of the queue to be refurbished, so you can just like do that progressively. Uh, and therefore, you have like an extremely reliable, schedulable, repeatable uh, like series of space launches, like we, a oh. bus, like a like a yeah. shuttle, if you will. Uh, I mm -hmm. see. That's why they call it the space shuttle. Mm, yes. it's a shuttle they, to space. They could have called it the space bus. Space bus. Call it spa space bus. I like space <laughs> bus more. That's kind of it's kind of more fun. Yeah, um, I, I like space bus a little bit. But it's really more, more of a space truck when yeah. you think about it. That is true. Space SUV uh, in other ways. Mm, yeah, because it's it, it's like it's kind of a bus. It's kind of a cargo truck. Uh, mm -hmm. The stuff that you want this to do is to like. Launch satellites off of the back of the truck, build uh, a space station off of the back of the truck, or like put people in space for a bit and then take them back down again. Much uh, like an SUV, seat seven is surprisingly delicate. Yeah. <laughs> Pro prone to dangerous rollover. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I think we have a slide here about the solid rocket boosters There's themselves. A slide the solid rocket boosters. Which is mostly about how NASA is a railroad. Yes, this is true. NASA is a class 3 railroad. Yes. Uh, and one of the reasons NASA is a class 3 railroad is because Morton Thiokol, which makes these solid rocket boosters, or made them I should say, shipped them by rail across the country, uh, and then NASA would get them delivered to a rail yard, and then have to move them th across 13 miles of NASA track from the NASA rail yard to the vehicle assembly building. Uh, which is a train carrying like millions of tons of explosives, as I understand yes. it. Yes. Yeah, sounds right. What's that sign Wait, say? So do not eat. It says <laughs> do not hump. Oh. oh. I'm not sure why humping would be like a a, a concern on like a, a closed track. Well, uh, there's always a risk that one of these cars somehow gets misrouted onto the main rail network. Oh no. Um, oh no, now we've got a yeah. SRB going up the East Coast. Yeah, an SRB <laughs> that's like, I don't know, been routed to Selkirk somehow, and someone, <laughs> someone wants to classify it over the hump, and then it's just rolling free down the hill, uh. slams into, I don't know, a car full of molten sulfur or something. And then you have a situation. Um, <laughs> Putting it mildly, but yes. Uh, NASA, NASA has three locomotives, and uh, when they had to haul solid rocket boosters, they had to do it across uh, a drawbridge, a sh uh, like shitty, rickety-looking drawbridge over a swamp, because this is Florida. Uh, mm. And in order to like make that work, they had to double the length of the trains. Uh, and so like going at like two miles an hour, you'd have one of these cars with solid rocket booster parts in it, uh, and then, like an empty spacer car to spread the weight out across this bridge, so you didn't just collapse it. Uh, That's surprisingly which is... common, though. Really? Yeah, spacer cars are like you know, you know, yeah. high demand on industrial sidings because they're all shit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then, of course, NASA interchanges with the Florida East Coast Railroad, which I'm sure was great because the Florida East Coast has historically and currently. Uh, run by insane people. Um, <laughs> just the craziest, craziest people in railroading. Um, you know, th they're the only people who were crazy enough to say, we're going to start passenger service up again in 
2015. And they're going to compensate by running all their freight trains at 80 miles an hour, regardless of the cargo. God um, bless them, man. <laughs> and the result of which has just been, um, okay, very, very good on time performance. Also, lots of people being murdered at grade crossings. They mm. should look out for the trains. We should, probably should look out for the trains, yeah. <laughs> You're not allowed to say that, though. I'm being censored. Cancel culture. No, this is true. <laughs> Next slide, please. I wanted to ask a question. Shoot. This is a large refrigeration unit on the back of this SRB car. Mm. Why would you need that? Uh, solid rocket fuels are in incredibly dangerous chemicals uh which do not like they react vigorously with everything that's why they're good fuels so probably my guess is you want to keep them very cold i guess it'll do it yeah in, until you don't and then you can just do whatever with them because they're just gonna like react vigorously uh mm -hmm. I do like the the placard here. Uh, high explosives, one point three C. That's putting it mildly. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit, a little spicy load. Uh, <laughs> so we've we've got the solid rocket boosters out of the way for now. Uh, we have to talk about the world's largest glider, uh, the orbiter, the like the plane bet. Uh, this, this is the plane. So, did, about the SRBs, real quick. Mm. Um, they were <clears throat> part of the reason they were there. I've I've researched is a, a nod and a uh, a hand. I don't want to say hand out, but a uh, a hand in to uh, the uh, <laughs> ballistic missile folks. Who uh, uh, <clears throat> rocket guys getting sad if they don't have their rockets? They gotta play. Yeah, yeah so you gotta you gotta let everybody play. That's a part of the <laughs> part of the uh, whole NASA ethos, really. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. So the orbiter is it's a big glider. It's got two, uh, two whole floors of of crew stuff up front, and then a big payload bay in the back. Uh, with a big empty space for the thing you want to put into space or take home from space. Like if you want to kidnap a satellite. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, do, if you do want to kidnap a satellite, what you do is you roll up on it and then you use uh, the Canadarm, my favorite. Oh, uh, we uh, helped! Canada. Canada <laughs> I love the Canadarm so much. Canada <laughs> built the arm for, for the space shuttle and they called it the Canadarm and it had a big Canada on it so you knew that it was Canadian. Uh, and that that was like a remote manipulator, and also like a t thing to tether astronauts to. Um, and yeah, you just I guess like grab the thing with a Canada, and stuff it in the back, and go home. Oh, uh, you want this satellite, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and, oh yeah, I'll help you with that. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> in in atmosphere, the orbiter apparently flies like a brick. Uh, it's like it's a pig. It's unpleasant to fly, but then it's you know it's supposed to be. It's it's coming in at like uh, some obscene velocity and altitude and trajectory, and then you have to like land it on a runway. Um, you may also notice that it's covered in bathroom tiles. Uh, you can see here in in white and black. Uh, these are extremely heat resistant ceramic tiles. To make sure that it doesn't like, <laughs> like, just burn on re-entry, um, and the black ones are like for more, uh, more heat-prone areas than the white ones. And if you wanted to annoy a shuttle engineer back in the day, I think the question you would ask would be, if you have to re-tile large parts of your spacecraft after every flight, is it still reusable? Because that was a serious concern, because you would just lose tiles on re-entry, or, you know, on launch, every time. And every mm -hmm. time you would have to inspect sure. every single one of these millions and millions of tiles, uh, and replace the ones that were missing or damaged. I just, I just like that our, our, our um, you know, our premier spacecraft is uh, built out of masonry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's a brick structure. <laughs> we got Philly yeah. City Hall floating up there. Yeah, <laughs> flies like a brick. Is yeah. a brick. Is a brick. Is <laughs> several bricks. 
Now, uh, I, some things that are interesting are the uh, the bay doors. Uh, the interior of the bay doors are big radiators that uh, once you got into space, you had to open them. And uh, if they did not open, then you had to come home immediately. Um, without the radiators, uh, all the life parts, you know, the part conducive to life would overheat um, in, in addition to lots of other subsystems. And so there's all kinds of fun what ifs, you know, what if it didn't open, you got to come home. What if only one opens and then, of co- and then really fun. What if it doesn't close before you come home? And they included uh, some, some, I guess you would call them contingencies where someone would have to manually uh, go close them and bolt them shut themselves and then sit in the, and then sit in the uh, cargo lab in the cargo bay during reentry. Oh my um, God. No, thank you. <laughs> that <laughs> never happened. Nope. How are you doing back there? Not great, Bob. That sucks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. That's how I'm doing. Yeah, just be in the jump seat. Great. You can't. Can you imagine riding the fish on the space shuttle? <laughs> Speaking of jump seats, I mean, they did have like a, a, a procedure for like a, a, a sort of like a mid-launch abort for like the twenty seconds when they could still like parachute out of this. Was seriously like uh, mooted, I believe. Uh, and then, like, due to the like flight characteristics, that was kind of like abandoned because. Mm. Well, so when it, it goes up and then it actually does this kind of dramatic roll, so that the shuttle is actually on the underside. So I guess in theory you could shoot them straight down at the mm. Earth, and then, but you know that that's that's just all conjecture on me waving my hands in the air. Yeah, I'm. I'm still. I'm imagining. You know, some some guy trying to shove these doors closed like a dented hood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, put a top out. on it. Put just, a top yeah. on it. Oh, buff out. <laughs> just holding it shut like Spider Man or something as they're screaming into the atmosphere. <laughs> God so, damn! So they, they built <laughs> six of these it with a branch like uh, Basil <laughs> Fault. Five and a half. <laughs> <I> think, <right? laughs> <laughs> they, built, they built five and a half of these, and uh, a, another way to annoy a shuttle engineer would be to <laughs> to say, okay, well, if this is something you intended to produce I- I- in series, reusably and replaceably, why is each one of these different? Um, because none of them, like, they are of a series, but on the inside, like, they I- they incorporated new developments and new improvements on each one. So each That's one was, not- like... It's like any oh, yeah. short run <laughs> large industrial machine. You don't really figure out how to build it until you build the last one. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. sometimes I yeah, not even then. It's like a, a a small technology called interchangeable parts, which does not occur in a lot of places here. Uh <laughs> So, so, and in, like, just you know, obvious to say, but it's also incredibly complicated. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be happening all the time to make people not die when they're in this. Uh, you know, several several miles of computers, all of which are going into like you know something with. It's not quite as bad as the Apollo program, where you're like, yeah, you can either have an entire Apollo life support system or part of a Mario game from twenty years ago. But it's like. Is getting up there, you know. Sure. Oh yeah, there was a lot of advancement during its lifetime, and uh, it, yeah, they, they started out with the you know CRT monitors with green text and ended on flat screens mm, and windows. Wow. Well, we can also talk about the big liquid fuel tank, uh, which oh, is big. It's very so large. They were lying. Part of the Oopsie Daisies. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you, you see that that texture? What, what the liquid fuel tank's got on it? That, that's spray on insulation. Yeah. That is, uh, it's an eclair. It's a, <laughs> it's a large eclair. Mm. Mm, tasty. It's covered in foam on the outside. Gigantic foam. Dildo. I was gonna say dildo, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very unsafe because it doesn't have a flared base. Honey, look what came from Adam and Eve and it just crushes your house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one didn't burn up on re-entry, oops. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have fun with this tonight. Oh, gonna... Yeah. This is also yeah. like a, one of the one of the largest and most complicated parts of the shuttle, and it's also the like definitively non-replaceable part. Uh, which is mm-hmm. fucking great. That's very funny to me. 
Well, they uh, stay in ha- space for quite a while before they come back. Yeah, and then they just mm. like you know land in in rural Australia, and people like poke at stuff that's covered in hydrazine or whatever. Oh, good, uh, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you have to build a new one of these every time, um, which is a- a- again another kind of a limiting factor on your reusable spacecraft. Uh, next slide, mm-hmm. please. The, the the one we showed earlier was white. They figured out at some point that you didn't have to paint them. They'd be fine mm-hmm. if you didn't paint them. Honestly, I think it's it less was right white. off of the first flight, yeah. yeah. Although, you know, arguably, I don't know what the uh, structural characteristics of paint are, but if paint could possibly, possibly keep the foam on the, the tube, you know, maybe the paint would have been worth it. Yeah, but then you'd lose that cool, like, iconic uh, orange look. Orange, yeah. We well, could so, paint it uh, orange. The, the paint was, uh, I believe, 600 kilograms of weight. I was going to uh, say, saved. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my F-1 space shuttle. You got you to gotta think about these spacecraft, like, uh, you remember Need for Speed Underground 2? You yes. do all the weight, little bits <laughs> of gotta, weight. Saving. You got to yeah. take the speakers the out, man. Yeah, you got to take the air con out. Take, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got to have the, uh, you know, the same philosophy, right? Mm. <laughs> so. Where, this slide, this slide, I, I tentatively have as like problems with the shuttle versus single use disposable rockets, and we have Rock. on yes. on screen this here a couple is, yeah, of that like rather suggestive. <laughs> a couple <laughs> of like sort of speculative ideas for what we could have been doing with rockets. Like the the U.S. Postal Service shipped mail by rocket mm-hmm. once. Uh, and was fully expected to ship it by mail, uh, ship mail by rocket more than once. I like this early Osprey here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Somehow it's the safe one. <laughs> <laughs> so, just flying helicopters next to rockets, which are taking off. This is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is like a one vision of the future where we like drive the cost down and we try and make rockets as disposable as possible instead of you know the opposite of that where we try to salvage as much as we can from them all the time. Um, we have a large rocket catcher. Yeah, we, we have a large tracks. rocket <laughs> condom. Which the, <laughs> my the, question is: the rockets coming in from space, not be just coming down from a few miles down the, the do uh, hard railroad turn. there. Yeah, yeah. I like that it's right next to a farmhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine the noise that that makes. No, it's it's safe enough. We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, like. I suppose my sort of general philosophical point on this slide was that, like, we should talk about boringness, and we should talk about good boring and bad boring, right? Because the Space Shuttle kind of coincided with, and was symptomatic of, NASA's sort of, like, like sort of narrowing of horizons, right? Like, going to Mars stopped being a priority, and instead priorities started to be things like satellites and space stations. Um, which is like it's it's fine, but like it also meant that it kind of like space launches became kind of quotidian to a lot of people. Um, like uh, people sort of became bored of space, if that's fair to say. Um, like and Mars I, was earlier. Yeah, <laughs> and I feel like there's there's a sort of a material difference to something that's boring because it works well uh, and is like. Unexciting in in that sense, like it's, it's reliable. Now or yeah, utilitarian, yeah, exactly. Uh, as opposed to something that's boring because it represents something that's like less imaginative. Uh, like I feel like if you're able to suck the joy out of again, much with billionaires, if you're able to like sort of suck the joy and awe and wonder out of going to space, then that's a serious problem, right? Um. But Pretty like prestige e- national space program, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, and like even just on its own terms, if I, I've been kind of leading up to this, but like I feel like you can make an argument that the space shuttle is not a successful reusable spacecraft, right? It's supposed to be quicker and cheaper to build and refit than it is to just build a new rocket, but it isn't because you have to go over every single tile and every single bolt, and you have to build 
the the liquid fuel tank from scratch every time. Um, and you you also had to uh, unhook the uh, engines from the back and refurbish them, and mm-hmm. they would just switch them out. And um, you know, you you would see you would, it would not always be the same three on each uh, each orbiter. Mm. And also, conversely, while while the U.S. was doing this, the Soviet Union was sort of in its own way doing the rocket mail thing, uh, because uh, the, the, they built the more and more versions of the Soyuz, uh, which is I, I I have jokingly described it here as a spacecraft designed by men who didn't own shoes. It's like <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 very cheap. Uh, it's very, very simple, relatively speaking, for a complicated machine. It's very reliable, um, and it, it kills way fewer of its passengers in general. Um, like, and it can abort. It can abort. It, if, you, if you want a bus, it turns out that the bus is sort of shaped a bit like an onion, and it, it goes from Kazakhstan. Um, oh, yeah, it's uh, you know, based off of uh, onion domes and orthodox <laughs> churches, <laughs> which means they're protected by God. or conversely it's protected by communism because as we know first word of the soviet national anthem (laughs) yes thank you (laughs) thank you (laughs) love to be deafened to my engineering disasters podcast excellent next slide please so justin i put this (laughs) image in for you specifically uh, uh, very, very, uh, very reliable and boring, much like the F forty PHS. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what w- w- what the shuttle is supposed that to do is in space too. Mm. <laughs> versus what the shuttle actually does in space, uh, and what the shuttle is supposed to do in space is mm, you know, kidnap a satellite, right? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> what it? What it? Thanks act- again, Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What it's what it actually ends up doing in space is uh, launching a bunch of satellites in this very American, very fun technicality sort of way, where you have a civilian space agency with civilian administrators and civilian oversight and civilian astronauts, uh, all of whom are military officers who are putting a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office in low Earth orbit for military purposes from their civilian spacecraft, but it's not a military operation, and also it's classified. Um, I, I have a shout out there to STS-38, which is the most interesting one. Oh they boy. Just dropped, they dropped off two things, and one of them was a diversion, uh, and we actually don't know what the other one was. Um, uh, uh, they're probably returning some alien technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they were like, "Oh, oh shit!" Locomotives they want this don't one need back. batteries. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was codenamed Prowler, and what they did was they like they did some really interesting sort of orbital maneuvering to try and disguise exactly where it was going to be and when they were launching it, which is very interesting. So yeah, it probably was an electric Amtrak train. Yeah, um, exactly. It was. Uh, it was. Um, they were returning uh, the the completely alien. Technology of a train that takes uh, electricity from wires <laughs> <laughs> you can't have that in America. We're giving that back to um, um, I don't know yeah. the Gorplar Lorps of Xenomar <laughs> Five. <laughs> I, I I have included another like inaccurate but too sarcastic to pass up thing, which is uh, one thing that the Space Shuttle did: um, build the International Space Station and then retire in time to stop Americans from using it. Exactly. Nice. Uh, and just generally, sort of being being a cargo truck, like it makes it's a bus, it's a cargo truck. It puts stuff in space. It doesn't really take stuff out of space because that turns out to be more difficult than than people gave it credit for. Uh, but it, it launches a lot of satellites, some of which we can talk about. It builds a lot of space station. Um, it and it it takes a lot of people to space uh, who aren't just sort of in that sort of right stuff mold anymore uh, because there becomes this sort of both element of national competition in terms of like 
opening up access to spaceflight, but also like a, a sense of like maybe we should make this something more accessible. Like now that we have this method of space travel that is reliable and and safe and boring, it, you know, it's 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 boring enough and safe enough that a teacher could do it. Next slide, please. I like that the fuel pipe here is just diagonal and goes mm. straight into the engines back here. This is very yeah. Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> more struts <laughs> more rigidity that's yes. right um Ooh. so we got to talk about uh your your childhood trauma if you were too old for 9-11 to be your childhood trauma uh my dad went to high school with uh christina mcafee mm-hmm. mm. um my husband remembers seeing this on live tv in his classroom as a kid uh it's, this oh, is yeah, this traumatized is, the whole generation oh, because, shit, because yeah. of the yeah, teacher well, going yeah. up the in space. The challenges are blowing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I was about to say, they would have broadcast that in classrooms yeah. everywhere. There's actually been studies about how it affected East Coast versus West Coast children. Because if you were on the East Coast, you saw it on live TV. And if you were on the West Coast, you weren't at school yet. Yeah. Yeah. The, this was going to be the, the flagship of the teacher in space program. Uh, Krista McAuliffe was gonna do like science lessons from space. She was gonna inspire a generation to space flight, and NASA fucking killed her. Uh, largely because, I mean, this is an episode in itself, right? Um, to, but to rush through it, uh, the short version is that NASA developed an organizational culture due to both budget pressure and also just engineers being engineers that demanded more launches more quickly than they could deliver safely. Uh, NASA managers pressured engineers to launch in weather conditions that were too cold. They were told it was dangerous. People told them it was dangerous constantly. They knew it was dangerous. They did it anyway, and they killed a bunch of people, including a teacher. And then after they did that, they tried to cover it up. Um, because uh, it's just embarrassing. I mean, there was there was uh, an inquiry, and uh, you know, well, again, this is sort of like an hour and a half to to talk about. But my short version here is that, like, uh, one of sort of American space flight's unsung heroes, an Air Force, an Air Force general called Don Coutina and Richard Feynman, who. I, I put here, Richard Feynman was a piece of shit to women, but ensuring the truth about what happened to uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger got out uh, is like a big mark in his in his credit for me. Uh, it was like, and it's it's still like an engineering and a management study today of like how this was sort of something that was like forced to happen through a kind of uh, extreme culture of arrogance. Uh, which like uh, had had terrible results and also traumatized a generation of school children. Mm -hmm. And this is just from like an O ring, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. Long story short, they launch. They wanted to launch in uh, sub freezing temperatures, um, and the O ring design in the SRBs were just not up to par for that. And so when uh, these things, they flex and bend quite a bit, um, started flexing and bending on launch, uh, it, you, it started uh, leaking past the O-ring, as in hot gases that, from the boomstick uh, from one of the SRBs. And uh, it almost uh, worked, um, but uh, it started to flex some more later on, and uh, that is when it uh, uh, burned a hole into the uh, main tank, and then that that's when you see the rapid disassembly right here. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to depress yourself as if this wasn't enough, uh, I will point out that the, the crew compartment of Challenger survived that explosion and like descended to ocean where uh, it was destroyed, uh, and during which time at least some of the crew were conscious at least some of the time. So. Yeah, it just it's a it's a great way to be extremely angry at NASA and at NASA managers. Uh and in terms of like actual consequences for this, it's very very vague, right? Like it's sort of a lessons learned thing now, but if you're talking about like uh you know, w w did anyone actually like 
lose their careers over this besides the people who were killed. It's much fuzzier than it should be. Um, but this, this, this having happened, uh, sort of after a lot of a lot of inquiries and a lot of refits, the space shuttle fleet went back into service, uh, doing all of the same sort of everyday stuff that we've we've previously identified until just just another day going to space just another day riding just, the space bus just my f- job 5 days a week <laughs> <laughs> uh and then the second extremely rapid extremely unplanned disassembly and loss of crew and vehicle uh the columbia orbiter um and this this was um funnily enough also in many ways attributable to NASA managers uh, insisting on launches when they had been warned against launches because it, the bureaucratic costs of delay were too were too high, um, and so a, a piece of the foam that we uh, like that we identified on the giant foam dildo, the liquid the liquid fuel tank, uh, separated at launch. I, I think because it was too cold. I'm not sure about that. Um, it's it it they it's a problem that they had known about. It happens from time to time. Um, the, inside the tank is hydrogen and oxygen, which are kept very cold, so that it requires the foam. So being cold outside, I don't know. The the main tank should be okay with that because it's very cold inside. Um, but just the dynamics of launch will cause these things to come off, and they, they have video. Uh, where of the what the, the actual chunk that they suspect you can see it uh, break oh, off, hit right the wing, here, and then shatter. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and uh, so it's something I mean, that that has yeah. happened before, and they just kind of they gave it, uh, I guess, a watchful waiting response where they they're aware of it. Um, I, I'm I'm sure analysis was run, and just nothing, you know, just inertia had kept uh, anything from really being done about it. Mm. And also, like the, the the sort of the remedy here of you stay in orbit and you go out and you check every single one of these ceramic tiles individually uh, is so uh, so inconvenient and so disproportionate to the risk or the perceived risk uh, that yeah they just they they went ahead. Uh, as far as I know, the crew never even like knew this was a concern because there's no reason for them to. Um, I think there was something where they reviewed the footage uh, shortly after launch, and they're like, oh yeah, that thing fell off. Well, mm. um, you know, we think it hit something, but we don't know where, so we're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> yeah, and it, it turns out that where was uh, one of the leading one of the leading wing edges, uh, where it took out a, a clump of uh, of ceramic tiles, and these are these are small tiles anyway, uh, so it's like a tiny tiny hole. Um, but when you're dealing with sort of atmospheric reentry forces, it just uh, gets in there and it more or less just tears the uh, tears the vehicle it from the inside with its heat. Yeah, and I mean this one, this one you can kind of take some comfort in, like nobody knows anything about it because it's more or less too fast to process, um, and it's like essentially instant, which is if 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 I'm picking my way to be killed by NASA. Uh, then I'm then I'm taking that one. Um, Rather not be killed by NASA in the first place, first. Ideally, <laughs> ideally. Um, and I I feel like this this sort of like these two slides have sort of elided a bit of you know we did we did twenty years of unremarkable space flight in the sort of in the interim, right? Um, it, it, and it's not to say that this was like. Uh, <sighs> Sort of a universally successful program, obviously, but in terms of doing the stuff that it was meant to be doing, uh, like it worked significantly more often than it didn't. Uh, it's just that what it was meant to be doing was, well, a sort of relatively narrow brief compared to, you know, go to moon or whatever. Yeah, sure. and it, it's kind of like, uh, well. You know, we had uh, we had what 130, 140 space shuttle missions, and then uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, only two of them killed the whole crew. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is the one thing where I kind of like sympathize with the sort of the right stuff, guys. And I'm I'm going to get into that a bit in like the next slide, more or less. But like Gus Grissom, right before he was killed, uh, was kind of like they asked him about the the risk, and he was pretty blasé about this. And and one of the things he said was that you know it's a dangerous business. Spaceflight is 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 a risky activity, uh, and like at some point it may be made as safe as stuff that we do every day, but it certainly isn't now, and probably not in like the foreseeable future. Is um, astronaut a more dangerous job than police officer? <laughs> 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 that, that's actually a great question. <laughs> I'm. You, well, the thing is, right, like, being being an astronaut, if you go to space because it's so inhospitable, because it's so, like, hostile to human life, there are a bunch of, like, health complications you get anyway, like, even if everything goes well. Um, but the fatality of astronaut rates is 3.2%, uh, which is, like, a down, like That's pretty bad. That's a lot. It's pretty bad in, in the face of uh, other things that you would talk about and deliver kinds of percentages for like, I don't know, like, like battle casualties. Yeah. The, 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 the fatality rate for police officers is, uh, 0.018%. So yes, it's much more dangerous. Much it's more okay. dangerous than police <laughs> officer. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, the thin orange line. <laughs> oh God. We're, pu we're putting a subdued flag on the orbiter. <laughs> it's uh, it's the thin worm line for the yeah. NASA worm logo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the good one. <laughs> so I, we, it's been on the screen long, long enough that we have to talk about um, what I believe is Matt Lauer um, mm. discussing mm. how we are going warp eighteen with the shuttle. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> shuttles traveling nearly eighteen times the speed of light. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that, that talking to it. there. That, ooh, I'm not um, sure. I don't know. Uh, it's those got, like dad glasses everybody, yeah. everybody wore. Yeah, 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 it's kind of cool. My dad yeah. still wears those glasses. Yes, he does. They're good yeah. glasses. My uh, dad also wears those glasses. Actually, yeah, I kind of like the aviator yeah. glasses. I like it. I like it. It's the aviator a sunglasses technical authority. Like, yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, you yeah, used to see like tactical guys wearing them too. There's like photos of like Delta Force in the in like the Iraq War in like the first one, uh, and it's like a bunch of guys in like button downs and those aviator glasses carrying M4s. It's great. Like aviator glasses, I think are still for nerds. Aviator sunglasses became cool again recently. Yeah, but these weren't the sunglasses. Mm -hmm. They were just yeah, but the, if you're the just regular, the regular glasses. glasses. That's like dad glasses. Mm. And now are they transitions? That would that would be the oh the that's yeah uh, transition yeah, lenses that's are are mostly uh, um, worn by just insane people. Uh, <laughs> I see quite yeah, a bit for, of that work for when you want oh, to look as if you're wearing right. like slightly <laughs> slightly underpriced sunglasses indoors all the time. You kind of look like maybe you belong in the Columbine massacre. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you're just there by accident. <laughs> I just happened to be at the Columbine Massacre. I wasn't mm. involved. <laughs> That's good, Roz. You were six. <laughs> isn't, Columbine, isn't Columbine down the road from a giant missile plant, incidentally? Uh, 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 right. Yeah, I think so. Mm. So anyway, mm. um, yeah. the space shuttle, uh, you know, it, it served faithfully, only killed two of its crews. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna fucking cry, despite how much I hate the space bus, because we cancelled it. I don't know why I'm saying yeah. we. We canceled uh, it. It's been canceled. It, it, um, yeah, a victim yeah. of cancel culture. Victim of cancel mm -hmm. culture, yes. A victim of me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like the the thing that I've put here, right, is that if if commissioning the shuttle in the first place was a step down, the about the only thing worse I think you could have done is just like cancel it and not replace it. Um and that's that's what happened. Um, it's sort you know of like who really, uh, who really. Well, I mean, this this is hmm. just a fun po poke at Obama. But uh, before shuttle died, they um, were spinning up the constellation program, 
which uh, would have been the fall, would have been the successor, and then the, the kind of bastardized brainchild of the Constellation program has now become the SLS, um, which is which could be its own uh, episode. But uh, the uh, the Constellation program wanted to put a capsule on top of a single SRB booster and um, put people just put people on top of that firework and send people to space that way. Um, as a kind of stopgap, like, uh oh, we know the space shuttle can't go on forever. Um, here's here's just like a, 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 a capsule on a stick. Uh, but that plug got pulled by uh, Obama. And so mm, um, that oh, not much long after that became became the uh, or I guess things started going towards uh, private long private lifters not Thanks. long after that. Obama. Thanks, Obama. Um, Thanks, Obama. I, I guess this is also like. <laughs> The thing is that, like, NASA's greatest asset in uh, its entire career was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, because yes. <laughs> at any time you needed to justify either civilian, military, or the sort of grey area in between expenditure, all you had to do is go to Ronald Reagan, say, a guy who hates funding absolutely anything, uh, and, and say, yeah, but the Russians. Um, and once you sort of lose that military utility, once once the sort of once the red fleet is sold off to Pepsi or whatever, then uh, it, you know it's it's. Fall back. I, I, yeah, I, I I feel like there are like two narratives that we can present here: the smart one for brain geniuses like us, and yes. the like the fucking idiot one, right? And the fucking idiot one is. We used to have the right stuff, guys. We used to have guys in aviator sunglasses with buzz cuts, and they used to like do the business, right? But then America became soy and cucked and owned, yes. uh, and we like we stopped wanting to do cool based stuff like go to the moon and go to Mars uh, because we wanted to like do science and whatever, and just kind <laughs> of like float around in the like the the, sh the like the shallow end of the pool, right? We, we should go we back can't to being have space shuttles because. Because we spend all our money on genders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we should go back to being like cool masculine <laughs> test pilots again. That's yeah. the fucking idiot narrative. The other narrative that I want to present to you is that NASA is this sort of like this enduring tragic story of a federal agency that's nominally intended to do this purely speculative altruistic public good <laughs> for all mankind, right? I'm um, gonna cry. <laughs> right, and, and and then and then it turns out like it was actually it was all ideology and like from start to finish, whether it's like hiring in guys straight out of the Waffen SS all the way through to like just giving it to Jeff Bezos because we don't have like a, a Leningrad shipyard we need to take photos of anymore. It's it's all been entirely at the mercy of uh, just this this sort of like. Terrible political impulse. Um, I, I, I've put this. I've put this in later slides, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna shift it forward a little bit. But like my sort of my general point here is that humanity's journey into space continues to be an experiment in how much how much altruism we can get the worst and most cynical people on the planet to subsidize by accident. Um, and in order to do that, we've had to like, you know, swallow various amounts of, of of bullshit, like whether that's putting spy satellites in space or whatever the fuck else. But like, lately, it seems that you don't even don't even like have that usefulness because you can just get a guy from you know who got rich off of making guys pee in bottles to do it instead. Now, I mean, now that I've depressed us again, yeah. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, I gotta, Alice. I, I, I got to talk about the greatest tragedy in human history. Um, next slide, please. Um, a disaster for the human race: mm. the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, because <laughs> 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 okay, so the this, the Soviet Union made this. This is Buran. Uh, this is the orbiter part. It's it's attached to an Antonov cargo plane. Um, this gets kind of like derided as a shuttle copy a lot, and it is um, like in terms of like design concept. But at the same time, it's not like the Soviet Union didn't possess 
rocket scientists, right? Like they had <laughs> space flight experts. There are there is quite a lot that's innovative about about Buran and about that whole program. Uh, not least the rocket it was attached to, the Energia, which is still a going concern. But um, it like th- this made an uncrewed test flight. They they piloted one of these remotely, orbited the Earth, and then landed it successfully. That's um, right. And then, and then and then I think the USSR collapsed not long after that. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. really fucking they, they got it in under the wire. There. I were so yeah. happy we got them in under the wire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I, they built. I think it might have been like either two or three orbiters, right? Um, and then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, one of them was crushed when a neglected concrete hangar collapsed on top of it in Baikonur Cosmodrome. Um, and the other one is still there. It was getting graffitied recently. Um, and what it was graffitied with was uh, was a Russian uh, a Russian guy graffitied on it that we shouldn't go to space until we had like unfucked ourselves at home a bit more, which is a you know reasonably <laughs> trenchant criticism, I think. Um, it's uh, it's just Russian for uh, whitey on the moon, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to throw something in there about Whitey on the moon, and then I forgot to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the Buran had uh, some changes from the uh, shuttle. Uh, I think the biggest one is there are no main engines on the back. All of the thrust was delivered by the Energia rocket, and so this actually improved its cargo carrying capacity because they did not carry those main engines from the ground all the way into orbit and then just you know just to show the cool photos of them in orbit mm. um so it it had and this one doesn't show it so i'm not sure uh there there were models that had uh air breathing uh jet engines on the back just in pods and uh i'm not sure if it could or if the design at one point they had two uh one of them had four and they couldn't quite get it working right um, but it, it might have been able to actually take off from a runway, which to me might be the minimum uh, def- definition of an airplane. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. It's something that we only really saw in its like its infancy, and I think like that's right. If 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 this had had the lead in that the shuttle program had had, because if you look at like early shuttle prototypes, some of them are fucking wild stuff. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, then you, you know who who knows apple trees on Mars, but it's impossible for us to know because uh, Boris Yeltsin. Yeah, it's another one. Uh, Bor- between Boris Yeltsin and Ronald Reagan, they really uh, fucked up the Soviet Union. Oh boy, um, yeah, well. yeah, that was uh, definitely definitely um, as much as okay. Ronald Reagan wants to spend money on the space program. He's only doing it to bankrupt the Soviet Union, which um, worked. <laughs> I mean. Yes. One- uh, well, so, at least um, hmm. uh, I guess uh, I don't know how much we want to get into uh, the space station. Well, I guess earlier we were talking about, and this is just a b- little bit of a side. Probably the one thing that the shuttle hmm. did that that probably could not be done, and the, probably the, the biggest you know feather in its cap was delivering and then servicing Hubble. Um, so going, that was the one time it actually went back and grabbed something that it had put into space. It didn't bring it back down, but it replaced its wheels, its mirror, or, you know, uh, light collection stuff. And so that was the, you know, I would argue that was the coolest thing that the shuttle mm. did. Uh, and it's, it's, it's ISS, so funny. Mm. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's so funny, and it, like, ties into my point about, like, the, the sort of, like, useful labor we can extract from people who are determined to, like, turn it to sort of malign ends, that, like, the reason why the Hubble worked, the reason why it's, like, uh, like technology that's available is that it's just a spy satellite pointing in the opposite direction. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the exact same thing, it's just turned it actually, 180 degrees. They have NASA is actually sitting on more of them um, and wants to launch more spy satellites pointed in the other direction. Didn't didn't mm. the DoD just hand over a couple of spy satellites that were like declassified exactly. to NASA? Uh, just oh yeah, point these the other way. Go look at some mm-hmm. planets or some bullshit. We don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, you know it makes you question. You know what what did they actually Thanks, launch dude. versus what did they just hand off? You know versus you know as we. We're handing over spy satellites to NASA, like we hand off our mm. tanks to the cops. I guess. 
Yeah. yeah. What, what, yeah. what sort of like, and at least like, un unlike a, a, a tank, like there's a productive use you can put a spy satellite <laughs> to. So it's just yeah, like. Productive uses for tanks, like traffic <laughs> enforcement. <Yeah. laughs> you get it it just reasons. makes you wonder how, how much. Equipment. Yeah. How, how much we're wasting on nothing of use to anyone. You could uh, you could create the uh, most um, most dangerous job out there, space cop. Space cop, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not all bleak. I don't want to leave us on a downer, right? There's yeah. th this is a bold new age in in human spaceflight and human space <laughs> travel and space exploration. Um, next slide, please. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! <laughs> Oh no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to control myself. I'm not going to yell for an hour and a half about this slide. Um, <laughs> the, the, the thing is, oh, right? Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I, I, I think I've already sort of expressed quite a cynical view of of space and of like human space flight. Right? I don't think that like you can realistically say Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson are like. Unworthy of space when the half the guys who put the first uh, the first you know vehicles in space all had a bunch of like SS blood group tattoos and shit. Um, <laughs> but it's not a positive development that it's just sort of this toy for billionaires now. Um, both because like we should hate and spite billionaires in all things that they do, and we shouldn't allow them to be happy. But yes. also because like this is this is supposed to be something that should be done on like a national or ideally international level. Uh, it, it it's something that like you know if you want me to get sentimental about it is something that like should speak to our our, our broader impulses towards you know uh, the the advancement of human knowledge and like uh, a, a sort of a shared uh, respect and dignity for you know our our planet galaxy universe whatever which is somewhat undercut in my opinion when a guy gets to like make a giant dick rocket as a way of getting over his divorce Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What's interesting is just how much is built uh, privately upon um, that. It's been, you know, as these things tend to go, no surprise that a lot of these private, you know, getting it across the goal line required a lot of public uh, doing the rest of the work. Um, mm -hmm. And so things like the the only one that I really care about is the Falcon Nine that actually goes to orbit. All these other guys are pretenders. Um, but that one actually has delivered people to the ISS and it, it really does, uh, land its first stage. And so, you know, there are things to be said that yes, it really is doing these things. And we could have more of the argument that I would like to have is, was well, that the only way it could have been done versus mm. a lot of people say, uh, you know, well, he's getting it done. NASA didn't get it done, but it's, you know, uh, there are other ways besides the way uh, the way Musk does it, the way NASA does it, and then there's that's just uh, a false, you know, false choice. There's there's other ways to do it. Yeah, and I mean, listen, it's not it's not all bad uh, because as you'll see on the next slide, my final slide. I have um, a question. Yeah, please. Which is why does SpaceX seem to be so far ahead of everyone else? You know, because theoretically, this Blue Origin crap has a lot of funding on account of. Uh, 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 Jeff Bezos and stuff like that, but they just seem not be able to do anything. Whereas SpaceX is like, oh yeah, we're gonna land a rocket on a barge, no problem. Yeah, fuck you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is actually what it said in the mission notes too. Yeah, I wish I had a, I wish I had a straight answer for that. I, I've worked for neither company, so I could not tell you. You know, the, the, I, I feel like if we're, yeah, I feel like if we're giving Elon Musk credit for anything, which I'm really loath to do, it is that he knows when to buy a successful company and then like uh, demand credit for everything that it does. Well, I believe uh, he mostly stays out of SpaceX management, which probably helps them a lot. Mm, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, I think he could hand a lot of the success to the Gwen Shotwell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. I guess I guess my sort of my my closing slide here is that it's not all bad because there does remain hope for uh, <laughs> state based state based space flights yeah. conducted by friendly, accountable, liberal governments 
Um, oh man, I've seen this. <laughs> I've seen this picture. We we've looked at this picture at work and, and made speculations on what's going on here. This um, is. I, if, hmm. There's some interesting things to note just by looking at it. The the one thing is this uh, engine bell that is not centered in the back. Why is there only one engine and why is it not centered? Um, we're thinking that's that's for test bed reasons. It's not an operational engine that's expected to really command the thing. Um, uh, some capabilities that this thing is uh, kind of rumored to do is change its orbital plane uh, with an atmospheric maneuver, meaning it will dip into the atmosphere, turn its wings, and then change its mode of flight, and then, or change its direction, and then go back into space. And we made the dinosaur thing of like, uh, d like the dream that the U.S. Air Force had way back in the the sixties of mm -hmm. like very rapid course changes. Uh, well, uh, it turns out all you have to do to avoid murdering people with huge G forces is not have people aboard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is this is the X thirty seven B, which is uh, presently, you know. Up and down, doing secret space what. plane stuff, Se secret squirrel yeah. stuff. If I told you, I'd have to kill you, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, people take pictures which... of it, and um, it's it's pretty interesting that uh, you can find online. People will t point their telescopes at it, snap photos of it, and then kind of compare it to a CAD image, and then screw up the lighting on the CAD image to kind of prove that yes, I'm looking right at the X thirty seven B in orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So there's there's always this whatever we're using it for, and uh, we did get. Why, why are the people wearing hazmat suits? Hydrazine. Uh, probably hydrazine. Yeah. Uh, I guess that'll do it. Uh, also, like we did get um, the Hubble, the Hubble, uh, the ISS, Velcro, and Tang out of the sh out of the shuttle program. Um, mm -hmm. What else? What else did we get out of the shuttle program? What, what What else is a good note, like a happy note? I can I can end on. We got the Canadarm. Yes. Um, if you want to, like, yeah, I, grab, I guess you could argue stuff. that a large part of the ISS is was delivered by the shuttle. Although I could argue that the construction of the ISS did not necessarily necessitate the shuttle. Um, mm. The the Russian half of it was not built with a the shuttle. They were uh, just modules placed on a rocket, put directly into orbit, and and docked with its own uh, control systems to the rest of the uh, structure. Um, and so there, there's a uh, there's a kind of a, a cost there where each mm. module would have its own uh, control system that then becomes inactive once it is on the station uh, versus delivering a more of a dummy module that all it can do is be attached to the station. But I still don't mm. know if that necessitated the expense of the actual you know monster truck shuttle <laughs> delivery via monster truck shuttle saurus. <laughs> And if you, if you want to, you can go and see an orbiter in a museum now, which is, you know, you can, you can have a look at it and you can have a think about, uh, you know, how history happens. And, oh yeah, and, you, you can go, you can go to the Udvar Hazy Center by Dulles Airport, and yep. you can see the Space Shuttle and the Concorde, uh, both relics mm -hmm. of an earlier time. And the Enola <laughs> Gay. Yeah. <laughs> Man, if that isn't, yeah, well. So, uh. That's all, hmm. I guess so. Every it's it's interesting. There's when billionaires get involved, it, it can become a lot more uh, pared down and direct. When the government does it, um, with the way it, what happened with uh, the shuttle and and uh, with its fruition and development, um, was that it used to be part of a much larger, more ambitious project that was then pared down because Richard Nixon said, "I just do this part right here." And so the shuttle off the get go was uh, originally supposed to be part of a larger infrastructure. And so now it becomes a shuttle with no mission. And I think we kind of talked about that a little bit uh, where, you know, we kind of put we put the uh, cart in front of the horse. And so far as we built the shuttle and then said, OK, now go make a space station and go do the shuttle. Um, you know, which uh, you could have done some of those things without the actual shuttle. Um, but it. it started out as kind of a and then from there there's lots of uh uh different changes to uh a mean to the air force who nasa decided to play nice with um for pr reasons and uh just to get enough buy-in to make this thing happen 
uh, they brought the Air Force on board as kind of a, uh, you know, poison chalice. Uh, mm. And uh, so that created some more compromises where they uh, did some more design changes to uh, be able to do the uh, capture the steel satellite bit. And um, I think in some of those, in some of these design changes and compromises created some of the uh, inherent safety issues with the shuttle, such as the way it's positioned right low and on the side of, the, of a massive fuel tank, as opposed to on top or anywhere near the top. But to put it, move it up the tank would mean you would have to remove the main engines, which means they would have to go to the bottom of the fuel tank, which means they would no longer be reusable. And so it's all these uh, compromises you had to make um, that eventually put the shuttle with these solid rocket boosters low on the tank on the side. And that just the geometry of that design was probably a lot of most of the problems. If, if the shuttle mm. were higher on the fuel tank, things would not crash into it. Uh, it could possibly abort away from an SRB. Of course, the SRBs would not leak onto the shuttle. Um, so yeah. uh, it's it's just interesting, you know. I could we could go on. I don't have any you know grand point to make other than when a billionaire does it, they seem to sign a contract and do the thing. At least in in the Falcon Nine case, um, mm. when the, the shuttle seems like a kind of now what do we do? Yeah, question. like a design by committee. Yeah, right. yeah, and so it it uh, a a kind of. Uh, and or a, a metaphor I was going to use is the giant spider from Wild Wild West that seemed really <laughs> cool, but knowing the technology at the time, you have to know that that spider is not actually working. You know, it's working on screen for the ten minutes it was on screen. It breaks down. The boilers have to be replaced. Um, so I kind of feel the shuttle's similar. You know, maybe you could use say a Wizard of Oz situation. Hmm. But this, like, this, the, this the main tension issue between, with this, the steam mm. spider is probably that it, it, it has enough steam for, you know, 10 minutes of running and then you need to stop it and then you got to build up a head of steam <laughs> again. Stop for water again. <laughs> yeah. It's like an old yeah, uh, well, Stanley, uh, the Stanley Steamer that. car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, I guess my, my only thing left to say is that, like, Gotta find some way of resolving this tension between like civilian and military impulses if we're ever gonna get anything done. Be space nice. elevator. Yeah. Space, space, space elevator. Space elevator. <laughs> no, because then somebody's gonna be like, what if we put marines on it? What, what if we didn't? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what if we just give just the like, three of us do it? We'll do it fine. Uh, Four of us even. Like uh anarchist uh, space elevator, yeah. <laughs> Fully no hierarchy here, folks. Nothing yes, works. No, <laughs> you can go so. up, you can go down. <laughs> but not in a hierarchical sense. <laughs> mm. Well, that's the story of how our favorite Class 3 railroads uh, made a bus and then mm -hmm. cancelled that bus. Yes. It's very sad, and uh, I hope you're all upset now. Well, that's probably what they <laughs> needed to do on the space shuttle, is they should have put some railroad tracks in the back so you could put out... <laughs> Put a fifty-foot boxcar back in there and start delivering to, uh, you know, uh, various uh, space uh, industrial customers. Just go ahead. <laughs> kind of like the idea. Put, a, put an oil uh, tanker in it. Space shuttle as high as a uh, high rail vehicle. <laughs> Try to coax that fucking thing in for a landing on it's the more rails. Of a, it's more of a car float, but for space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could deliver oil from the tar sands with it. Mm. You could you you could deliver a whole bunch of plywood, <laughs> and then you could build the ISS real fucking quick. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got to send a, a framer up there. Get a bunch of carpenters up there. Yeah. Well, so it's, I, the other thing that's interest. Well, I don't know if the interesting or depressing. Uh, I don't know how anybody feels about the ISS. Uh, it, it's oh, I've, it, it I've, another, I've had some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it is another compromise. Um, Arguably good or bad, depending on uh, who you ask, um, and you know the closer you get to the to the program. I, I guess the big the biggest compromise is its inclination, so that the Russians can play. Um, mm. And uh, if if the space station, as originally uh, envisioned, space station freedom, God bless, is uh, <laughs> was uh, equatorial, then you could use it to get to the moon rather easily, and it could become a refueling depot. 
but at its current inclination, that benefit is largely diminished. I mean, the the, the answer here clearly is we got to give Russia an equatorial colony. Actually, yeah, um, yeah. Go, or go, let go, them go, launch out of Florida. Yeah, yeah or like split do Florida down the middle. <laughs> yeah, give them a uh, give them a, a like we have a Guantanamo Bay. Americans launched out of Baikonur with Russian, like, on Russian rockets, why the fuck not? Yeah, just just give them a launch pad. Mm-hmm. I think Orlando would look a lot better with some big Khrushchev, Khrushchevskaya's uh, in the suburbs, <laughs> you know? Um, I think maybe we could give them the villages, too, you know, just replace all that shit with um, big prefab concrete buildings. Uh, oh, God. You know, this, this, is, um, this, is a, this is a solution I support. All right, so... Yeah, uh, we're gonna give Florida to the Russians and have a better space <laughs> program. Uh, we found a good note to end on. Yes. All right. All right. I'm excited for this. And speaking of the Russians, today's safety third. <laughs> Comes from Russia. That's right. Wow, that does. <laughs> I'm surprised they even bothered talking about these. This is just a day in the life, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> Hello to lovely, well, there is your problem podcast listeners. Hello, hi, Roz, hi, Alice, yay, Liam. Thank you. Get. Hello to guests, if there are any. Fuck Hello. you, transphobes. That's right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I am going to tell you a story about how we do automation in Russia. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> As many of you know, the best way to make money in Russia is digging up its natural resources. <laughs> I've heard that in the game uh, you know. Workers and Resources of the Republic. Republic. <laughs> it's not just oil, though. Russia is pretty rich on minerals or mineral fertilizers in this case. Those things are contained deep below the Earth's surface, to the, so to get them, you have to create huge mines with very long and dark galleries in which you have to transport workers, tools, and shit. Right. Um, so not and the, open pit. We're going down shafts. Going, going down a hole. Going down in a hole. hole. <laughs> you lose sixteen tons. And the simplest way to transport workers and tools inside those galleries is a UAZ pickup truck. Oh no! Yes, yes. love these guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a that's a that's a was four sixty nine, I believe. Uh, yeah. In brackets here, yay fumes inhalation. <laughs> <laughs> Moving through those galleries is very speed restricted due to safety reasons. Uh huh. The thing is, you cannot really enforce those restrictions if drivers well, are, are not supervised down there. <laughs> well, you got to go faster than the fumes build up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if the drivers are not supervised and also. Of course, the void calls for them. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's the most Russian line in this so far. It's like, sometimes there is a void. (laughs) Sometimes sometimes when you are driving in Mineshaft, you must uh, contemplate ennui. Because of the the French influence in um, Russian culture, (laughs) owing to the... um, you know, oh, uh, thanks, Star- Peter the Great. Now, Peter now all of great, our like yeah. mine shaft guys have ennui. Yeah, congrats on Lapel de Vid. <laughs> <laughs> Not willing to pay fines every time when one of those trucks crashed into something or someone, owners of one of those mines decided to do something about this nasty speeding habit. Okay. Put a cop down there. Put a cop down there. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. No, this is Russia. <laughs> uh, roundabouts, yeah. uh, fucking chicanes, traffic calming measures. The first thing they did was remove the gear shift sticks from the trucks. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> what? <laughs> Jesus! Wait, remove the stick entirely? So you're just yeah. always in first? So you just have a yeah. shift? Yeah. Can you even do it? Can you shift with vice grips? <laughs> This was pretty naive, since you can still drive the trucks up to 60 kilometers an hour in first gear. <laughs> Just screaming. <laughs> Have you ever played the game SnowRunner? <laughs> this is actually adding a lot of um, uh, 
credence to my idea of giving uh, Florida to the Russians because the culture is very similar. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're screaming in first gear, now you've got you're making the fumes problem only worse. That's yes. true. Also, this added a lot of engine wear since the RPMs really went up. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the owners of the mine thought, "Fuck this shit! Let's get rid of the drivers altogether." I like to Here imagine. I like to imagine that in between there were several intermediate steps where they just took more shit off of the car. So they're just like, "Oh, we we permanently apply handbrake." <laughs> So now the yeah. fucking <laughs> just, just going connect through. the brakes, so they just can't go fast unless they want, unless they can't stop. No, because yeah, then gotta, the you void. Gotta, you got yeah, oh, to stop yeah. it with your feet. <laughs> <laughs> you are the e-brake. We have removed floor like in the American documentary Flintstone. <laughs> it's similar to ice fishing vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> They couldn't use any existing solutions to the problem because after the Crimea ex annexation in 2014, quote, Western, unquote, companies were prohibited to sell to Russia any goods that could be used in military applications. Hmm. Yeah, I know. It's also yeah. why PayPal won't let you pay a Russian guy directly to buy some camouflage gear from him. Oh Same thing goes God. in the opposite it's direction. I know. I'm so I PayPal is uh. such a pop. Uh, these sanctions can and are being worked around, but these particular mine owners did not have the right connections. <laughs> Never heard of an unconnected Russian mine owner. I, 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 there's got to be different tiers of Russian mine owner, right? I suppose. <laughs> and also, these sanctions created a propaganda trope called uh, import <laughs> import substitution. Right, oh, ersatz. Yeah. Okay. So basically, every propagandist here makes great a great proud fuss every time when something in Russia, someone in Russia creates anything high tech related, no matter the quality of the product or its usefulness, uh, which is usually something completely shit and or bonkers. Uh, look up robot Fyodor. I've seen some of these. I've seen like RT News will put out a big thing being like Kalashnikov uh, announces like self driving uh, quad bike and it's like it's a quad bike with a robot version of the Stig from Top Gear riding it. <laughs> and yes, it is uh, pretty easy to get some government money to do some shitty or even non existent work. Uh, so, tech grants. We don't have anything like that here. Uh, it certainly would never happen in the United States. No. Um, so naturally, mine owners contracted a firm with the task of creating a self-driving UAZ truck, right? Sure. Since no one in that firm had any skill or a wish to use anything more high high tech uh, than you know than anything more high tech than a welder, that firm co subcontracted another firm in which I work to make the UAZ actually self-driving. Oh no. <laughs> mm. They don't want to just put it on a rail like uh, like like you would do at, at amusement parks. Like, uh, <laughs> like are, are you suggesting a really old fashioned technology, a train? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would think that the rails are pretty ubiquitous in, in mine shafts, but who knew? Yeah, yeah. apparently apparently not. This this needs to be high tech. How are we gonna make an autonomous was? And the thing is, it was really fucking fun and easy. <laughs> okay. Yes. Cool. Good. Shake hands yeah. with danger. Can I have one, Shake hands with success, <laughs> Alice. Yes. Basically, we had to replace the gas and brake pedals with corresponding electrically controlled parts taken from Western cars. <laughs> uh, replace the steering wheel with a step motor, which was produced in China. Stick... <laughs> Stick a LiDAR sen sensor on top, bought in California, um, and uh, put a PC made in China inside and connect all those with some cables. Suck it, uh, Tesla! And, and a Raspberry <laughs> Pi. And a oh, single dude. circuit board, which we designed and produced. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> This, this, uh, it's such a shame again that the Soviet Union collapsed because this person deserves the like little hero of socialist labor yes. medal. 
Oh, yeah. If anything, <laughs> that UAZ was made less Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the code was open source, so programmers mostly worked with sticking it all together. Uh, time-wise, all it took was a team of three programmers, one hardware engineer, and one guy with a uh, uh, solder with skill at soldering. Well, guess which one is me? Uh, it took them less than a year. Um, I don't know how much harder it is to make a self-driving car, which is safe enough to be released in the wild without supervision. But Elon is a fucking slacker. <laughs> 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 the prototype car was creating a map of its surroundings promptly moving between chosen points basically was a fucking uaz roomba (laughs) (laughs) it never hit anyone or anything this car was a fucking success money changed hands business owners profited all reports were nicely written and no one went to jail this is incredible (laughs) The UIZ was even filmed, but I am not sure where that film went. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> but since producing a mine Roomba automated self-driving robot apocalypse truck uh, in mass turned out to be co- to cost more and uh it turned out to cost more than paying fines for production related trauma and replacing some dead impoverished workers with slightly less dead ones. After producing this first prototype, the whole project was successfully shelved. (laughs) (laughs) Successfully shelved. (laughs) And on a personal note, Kvass is a fucking supreme drink. It's not a soda, though. It's naturally fermented, so it's closer to a beer. Make some of your own. Add some sugar to make it alcoholic. Drink it up. It's a fucking drink. It's the fucking best drink for our heating climate. <laughs> this, all I can think of is, is, nice Joe, is Joe and Nick from Hell of a Way who tried to make their own kvass and nearly died in the process. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking try and make your own kvass. Try and make your own self driving truck. Yes. Uh, uh, drink the kvass while driving your self driving truck. It's not, yeah. I'm not I'm, driving. I'm, I'm it's driving. driving. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 the cops the mine cop stops you in the autonomous truck and you like roll over to the passenger side open the door and a bunch of empty jars of kvass fall out that seems to be the officer problem <laughs> as you can see i was not driving <laughs> this is my robot jenkins <laughs> Otherwise, love you all. Keep up the great work. Thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Shake hands with danger. That was Not a good really one. shaking hands with danger, but I appreciate it, it a lot. It was really good. It was a good one. It was good. Yeah, yeah I, I was wondering where the turn into danger was, but um, uh, I, I it, not, none of it seemed to be especially dangerous, except from like brewing that your own class. No, well, yeah. it's very dang, It's very difficult to make an alcoholic drink that will kill you. Because of mm. the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it will certainly kill you slowly over a long period of time, yes, sure. but it won't, it's not going to give you an infection of some kind. Mm. Right. Well. All right. Well, that was Safety Third. That was Safety Our, Third. That was the Space Shuttle program. Yes. Mm-hmm. Our, Our next, next episode, episode will be on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Disaster. And our next bonus episode, which I have started writing, if you guys want to look at slides, is country. Country. Country, music. especially yes. country music post 9-11. Yes. We're going to talk about trucks and God and girls and beers and hmm. going to the lake and why Lil Nas X is country because of Florida Georgia Line is country, Lil Nas X is country. Uh, right. I have to hop off because I have to go hmm. watch the Black Rifle Coffee Company movie. Oh my <laughs> god, dude. Um, does anyone have commercials before we go? Lions uh, Love by Donkeys. Kill, Kill James, James Bond. Bond. Trash Future. Trash Future. Mark, you got anything to plug? I I don't. Okay. <laughs> write, write your congressperson about uh, NASA and do, say there should be more of it. Yes. Mark, do you want people to follow your Twitter account? Oh, I mean, 
Possibly. I, yeah, no promises, but I'm okay settled down. Uh, you can find me there. Yeah. We'll like, uh, Thanks so much for least. coming on. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, I feel like uh, this is r- really a case of a fan being pulled up on stage. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, I, our pleasure. I have one announcement before we go. All right. Um, if this you're is about a Franklin. Patreon this is about of ours, Franklin. No, no, this is serious. All right. No. If you are a Patreon of ours, um, one of our patrons was charged quite a lot of money as opposed to the amount of money they thought they were being charged. I just refunded them today. So uh, if for some reason your bank account is much lower than you thought it would be, um, check how much money Patreon oh, took from yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's about all I can say on that. But from, from what I can tell, I think it may have just been that one guy. But I figure since it happened, we should probably mention it. Yeah, just so long as we're not like sitting yeah. on top of like a heap of ill-gotten gains here. Yes, exactly. I mean, okay. we are definitionally. That's what podcasting yeah, but is. But like I- but- I- ill-gotten gains. Exactly. Sure. Ill-gotten gains. Thank you so much for supporting the Patreon, guys. The surgery fund proceeds apace. Yes. Yeah, uh, Roz, email that lady. Uh, oh, Alice, oh yeah, get your that. goddamn passport. Yeah, oh boy. yeah. Uh, yeah. A closed captions. When is Franklin happening? International shipping is a thing now. Goodbye. Um, yes. Goodbye. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. <laughs>